Today's episode is brought to you by Brilliant.org. And welcome back to another video. And today we're gonna to do a video on the damaging effect of this productivity culture that we're all, all a part of. The hustle culture, how you have to work beyond the nine to five, and how you have to really get down in a grind set in order to complete all these tasks. But recently I've been reading a lot of stuff and reading a lot of books uh, by this Korean German philosopher by the name of Bien Chul Han. And one of his books called The Burnout Society really casts some light on this damaging effect that productivity is having on all of us. So in this video, uh, as a broad series covering a lot of different philosophical works and to give some problems a philosophical lens, this video is going to philosophically provide a philosophical critique for this overproductivity that we have. So let's start from the very beginning, which is with a very curious observation. If you ever sit a writer down and you ask him, what is your process of writing like? How do you write a novel? Well, like, what is your writing routine like? What you're gonna realize is that the writing space on the internet, or at least for my space and for various novelists, it, it is a very idiosyncratic space where each writer has their own little thing going on. And whenever you try to ask them about their process, they always seem to try to find the nearest fire escape to run out of. Because fundamentally, writers don't really know how they how they write a novel. They don't really know the process that goes on behind it. And if you try to analyze their art form retrospectively, sometimes things become clear, but as the writer's writing the thing, they don't really know how they do it. And the Italian novelist, Inberto Eco, is not an exception. In an interview in 2015, Tommy Vorm actually interviewed Inberto Eco on his writing process and asked him the forbidden question for all writers, which is how in the hell did you come up with a novel idea and how did you write the name of the rose? which was Umberto Eco's first novel. And he responded with a very sort of sarcastic comment. It happened when you feel that you have to piss and you have to, to, to run to the toilet. And then he added that thing. I cannot understand those novelists that publish a book every year. They lose this pleasure of spending six, seven, eight years to, to, prepare, to prepare a story. That's a very curious observation because in this economy, I don't think writers have that much time to prepare a story. Everything is about consistency, and a metric for online writing turned from quality of writing to consistency. In this economy, at least, I want you to observe like this idea of spending six, seven, eight years, as Umberto Eco uh, did, to prepare a story or to prepare an article. It is no longer the fashionable way of doing things. For example, now I spend a lot of my time writing on Substack, and one of the things that really irritates me on Substack is that the key metric or the key measurement of your writing is actually not engagement per se. There's an open rate on each email, but it actually depends upon your consistency of uploads or consistency of writing. So in a sense, consistency really took over the quality of writing or really took over the time we need to prepare an article, to prepare a marinated idea, and to use Umberto Eco's funny toilet analogy, it is as if the writing economy is forcing us to piss before we even have the urge. And this is gonna lead us to the second problem, which is the problem of procrastination. Back when I was doing my Bachelor of Arts, I was a crazy person, so I spent the entire semester doing a full course load. And what happened was, I was always this stickler person. I was always this person who turns in assignments like a week before the due date. But in retrospect, after I graduated, I started looking over some of my older essays. They were all full of typos in some essays, and one of these essays even has some pretty severe citation errors, but it is just to me, it was a case of productivity uh, seeping into my work. As I turned productivity into kind of like a goal in itself, it really sacrificed the quality of the work. So this addiction, this productivity addiction that I have, is what the philosopher, the Korean-German philosopher, Bian Chul Han called, uh, it's a natural consequence of this concept of the achievement society. Back in the days, people were theorizing, at least um, at the end of the 20th century, people were theorizing about a repressive power, a negative power, where people have to tell you to do things, where people put a gun to your head to force you to do things. But in an achievement society, according to Bian Chul Han, no one's really forcing you to do anything. So in a sense, all of us become achievement subjects. The key incentive for this achievement subject is to do as much as possible, is to motivate themselves as much as possible and to complete some sort of aim. And in this case, it feeds into this pathology that Bian Chul Han called, um, in a sense, this addiction to productivity that turns us all into self-motivating subjects where we don't suffer from a negative power, but we suffer from an excess of positivity. The verb can, becomes the modal verb that excites everybody. You can't do this. 
just do it. So Bian Zhuhan wrote very beautifully, quote, prohibitions, commandments, and the law are replaced by projects, initiatives, and motivation. End quote. This is probably why, have you ever noticed that the motivation section in your local Barnes & Noble or your local bookstore, they're getting fatter and fatter every year. I remember when I was in high school, the motivation section was kind of like just a little sliver at the bookstore, but now it spans across three or four different shelves. There's really a boom in a self-help industry because as people get more and more self-motivated to become self-made entrepreneurs or self-made productivity junkies or self-made achievement subjects, there's more of a need for us to find solutions, not for personal happiness, but for the quickest way to increase motivation, the quickest way to get the most amount of stuff done because we're literally addicted to completing projects. As they start to get enamored by this idea of I'm gonna do as much as possible, as everyone gets addicted to this idea of motivation, that then consequently gives rise to the idea of a work ethic. The word work ethic here is not as innocent as it seems. Work ethic actually has a pretty good reason to be there because ethics implies a system of morals and a system of how you should behave. If people fail to comply to these standards, and if people fail to somehow find a way to, to fulfill these morals, because you know typical morality in terms of ethics, when you fail to fulfill, sometimes you have to go out of your way to fulfill an ethical standard, but if you fail to comply, people tend to look at you with judgment, with guilt, and tend to ostracize you from the community. In the same way, in the achievement society, Sometimes we don't really call these people madmen or criminals when we don't comply to this code of work ethic, but instead we call them depressives and losers. How many times have you guilted yourself for being quote unquote by society standards as a loser because you couldn't complete a task? How many times did you exercise that self-restraint to not be a quote unquote loser? So that is the essence of the self-motivating subject. We police ourselves. We can say that we've turned our society into a labor camp where one is simultaneously a prisoner and guard, victim and perpetrator, as we exploit ourselves. Going off from that line of logic of the self-motivating subject, what are some of the prices that we're paying for this overproductivity? One of the direct consequences, according to Han, of this zealous culture of achievement is that we are constantly surrounded by excess stimuli. We're constantly surrounded by images, sounds, TikToks, YouTube videos, and different music videos on YouTube. They're all popping up all at once, cramming your feed. By the very fact that everyone's motivated to create more and more and more and more content, guess where all, all this content is going? You're right. So we are consuming the very thing that we've created. We've created a very environment of excessive stimuli. We've created a diet that we are consuming right now. So under this condition, we've altered kind of like our perception of the environment to favor multitasking. Because sometimes to survive in this information economy, in order for us to keep up to date, to, to follow, to keep up with the Joneses, we have to constantly fracture our attention. What this gives rise to is what Bian Han, Bian Han had a really beautiful analogy. He basically said that we start to resemble wild animals the more we fracture our attention. Quote, an animal busy with eating must also attend to other tasks. It must constantly be on the lookout, lest it be eaten while eating. In the wild, the animal is forced to divide its attention between various activities, end quote. So in that sense, we've really unleashed ourselves into the digital wilderness where scrolling the news is synonymous with eating dinner. And as you scroll the news, it's, you're not just looking at the news, you're also keeping uh, an eye out on that asshole from Twitter, you're also trying to defend your opinions through the comment sections. And the TV's probably also on in the background, so there's another stimulus right there. And then you're constantly switching your attention from one thing to another. Start to resemble an animal out in the wild who has to attend to everything all at once. The main difference between an animal and a human being is that human beings supposedly have this deliberate ability to contemplate. And this is what differs us from wild animals. But because we've trained ourselves to behave like wild animals out in a digital wilderness, we've really, really reduced our ability to deeply contemplate about things or to deeply think about things. Sometimes in our lives, the most rewarding experiences don't really come from fracturing our attention. Imagine going to a party. Sometimes the most interesting conversations, they tend to come out of just locking into a conversation with one person. And sometimes watching our favorite film again and again and again and again is way more rewarding than flipping through Netflix and try to watch two episodes 
out of every season of a show. And for writers and artists, sometimes it's way more rewarding to put more effort into one project over years, like Umberto Eco said, spend six, seven, eight years on one story and then write it and then craft it really well compared to fracturing your attention with constant two week long timelines and to turn out a bunch of mediocre work that you're not really happy with. For example, this video essay that you're listening to right now, it took me over a year to properly articulate it, to put it into words that are sensible and to really phrase this in the right way. Productivity addiction implies that you have to constantly turn out stuff, whereas doing good work requires you to defer that pleasure of completion and to spend more attention and energy on the task at hand. So what's the solution to all of this? Now you might be wondering, holy shit, we are in a pretty bad situation as self-motivating subjects. We're in a pretty bad spot. How do we ever get out of this mindset of being overly productive? How do we stop burning ourselves out over the silly thing of always needing to complete certain tasks? So contrary to popular belief, I actually believe that procrastination is not the problem. Procrastinating in a right way can actually set up the very conditions that you use to make your creative projects flourish. For example, when most people think about procrastination, when most people think about putting off work, they're in a sense still engaging with the information economy by scrolling through their phones or picking up a random book or turning on the TV. So in a sense, their brains are never really fully relaxed and they're not really in that state of full mental rejuvenation. So when they return to actually getting down to business or getting down to what, to what they actually need to do, they're still very much exhausted. And the state of exhaustion, and I quote Bian Shu Hang again from his really beautiful book, quote, we end up riding a hectic rush that produces nothing new, accelerating what is already available, end quote. Have you ever wondered why most TikToks have the same soundtrack over and over and over again? Which is because we don't have the mental energy to think about the soundtracks and because it, it is a very convenient way for us to slot that soundtrack in, this is why we are accelerating a culture of sameness we're accelerating and replicating the same thing over and over and over again, just so we don't have to spend more effort into creating new ideas or new content or new pieces of information. So if we ever wanna combat this hectic rush, we have to subject ourselves, sometimes against our instincts, to this idea of a profound idleness Bian Han talked about. So this state, unlike compulsive consumption, actually requires you to face boredom, maybe for the first time in your life. And boredom is such a condition that is so agitating to the modern mind that we almost don't want to look at it. When you're on the train, people can possibly check their phones to displace the boredom. When you're sitting at home by yourself, sometimes you don't even feel like you can be bored. Even during those moments when you feel like you can't be bored, maybe you know waiting for your doctor to get back to you at the dentist's office, you in a sense find some distracting activities to keep that boredom out of line without realizing that, for Bian Chou Han at least, boredom to the mind is actually what sleep is to the body and it encourages deep relaxation. And if we don't somehow schedule enough time or boredom in our lives, it is actually going to burn us out and giving rise to repetitive work, giving rise to mediocre work that the artist or the writers, they're not very happy with those kinds of mediocre work. And this is where healthy procrastination comes in at the very end of this video. And healthy procrastination forces you to deliberately schedule in ordinary activities or even, even quote unquote boring activities to relax your mind enough so you can give your mind enough space for new insights and ideas to come in. And for me personally, I really adore meditation as a, as a very deliberate practice of boredom. And I love practicing the piano because working through a long, complicated piano piece is anything but exciting. Finding those spaces for me to properly cultivate this ability to face boredom and to rejuvenate and to mentally recharge is really important for me when I want to put all of my energy into creating these videos, into writing more Substack posts, and to making more quality content for you guys. Because sometimes compulsive productivity is not the answer. And sometimes we have to make space for the things we love while we create the work that we also love. And speaking of bringing more activities into your life to relax your mind and to recharge you outside of work, one of the greatest ways to do that is by picking up a new learning project. And Brilliant.org, today's video sponsor, just happened to be the perfect tool for people to start learning math and science interactively. And for now, it is the best app for this very task. There's a bunch of courses here on Brilliant.org, ranging from computer science to basic calculus, all the way to something like 
artificial intelligence programming. So there's a lot of stuff on here. And for me as a humanities person, some of this stuff don't even occur to me because I am so blind to the development in the STEM field. But I think as a, if you want to be a well-rounded and well-educated person, it is helpful to gain a general understanding into those fields. And Brilliant.org has courses for every skill level. So it doesn't matter if you've failed calculus in high school. It has these levels of classes for you to choose from. And every single class comes with additional exercises and fun puzzle cases for you to solve and the end of class quiz for you to consolidate your understanding. For example, for me personally, in my spare time when I'm not working on this insane research thesis, I am currently still going through the very late stages of this mathematical logic course for me to learn some of the ins and outs of the symbols when it comes down to mathematical logic or formal logic because I am still digging through a lot of Wittgenstein and it is still not making much sense to me. So I think having that additional help from Brilliant.org really helped with me when I'm you know, getting down to the business of really absorbing formal logic as a subject. So if you're ready to try out brilliant.org right now, they are doing a special offer for you. So if you want to get 30 days for free for this amazing application or for this amazing learning platform, be sure to head over to brilliant.org slash RC Walden for your first 30 days free trial. And on top of that, if you really want to try out the full version of this app, they are offering you guys a 20% discount when you sign up for your annual subscription. Thank you, Brilliant, for sponsoring today's video essay, and I will see you in the next video. Rob Walden here, take care, and goodbye.